Okay, okay all right. So uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the Open Seas tutorial. So, uh, how many of you like installed the program? No. I tried, but I'm not sure. All right. Uh, well, it doesn't matter anyway because uh, in this one, like, uh, you probably won't uh, do it in the same time, like while uh, modeling this frame example. And the reason is, okay, so OpenC is, uh, so you have the website. Again, this is an open source uh, software. It's, uh, it has more capabilities and uh, a wider uh, material and component uh, library compared to, let's say, SAP. So it's basically the same thing that we did in SAP. We will do in OpenSeas, but without the user interface. So we need, yeah, so we need to open like text file and then we'll start writing commands. So let's say if I want to uh, create uh, a node, for example. So I need to say node, like this is the command, and then give it a number, and then say x and y coordinates. All right. Uh, the same thing like for uh, elements. So I need to say, OK, element uh, number, like whatever, I give it a number. It joins between like node number this and node number that and that's it and then i need to define like some materials so everything i need to write in commands like in text without seeing what's really happening and then you go and open like this open seas it's like uh, a basic uh, black window and then you write run and then you will find out what's happening <laughs> all right literally a black box yeah it's a black box so <laughs> But there is actually a navigator. Uh, it was released, I don't think, like uh, probably like two years or even less. Uh, so now they have like a navigator, a user interface, which uh, very much similar to uh, to uh, SAP. But if you want to use the, this interface, it's better first to learn how to use the commands because the interface, like the way to do it, it's pretty dependent on knowing the commands to uh, model the structure. And personally, I don't use the navigator. I always use the like those files, input files, because once you get used to it, it's a little bit strange or weird at the beginning, but once you get used to it, it's much easier. And it's better if you want to change like some things in your model, uh, you can just change in the text file or uh, it's easier also to find like if you have any mistakes in your model you can easily find it because anything you put into your structure any modeling assumptions any materials any components you already wrote it mm. other like different that from SAP if you say create an element then SAP in the background it says okay this element remember the set modifiers the thing we did like in SAP so those things, if you don't know and just click OK, those things SAP does like in the background, but you don't know because you don't see it unless you really know the program. So that's why like working with like uh, the commands and with, uh, with those text or input files, it's better because everything you write or everything is happening, you wrote it down. So you know what's happening. Anyway, so let's see what's happening. So you have the website, so openseas.berkeley.edu. So again, it's an open source. That's why like many researchers, they keep devo developing like those new materials, material models, and uh, those, new, those new techniques to solve uh, numerical uh, uh, equations. If you go to SAP, for example, and you try to remember the structure that we modeled the last time, if you try to do dynamic analysis, time history, it will work, but then if you try to uh, apply like a uh, strong ground motion, something that will cause the structure to go into the nonlinear range and maybe collapse, then SAP will have a problem after like maybe if you are applying like 60 second record, maybe after like five or 10 seconds, it will stop converging because of nonlinear issues. Here, because you can control all those black box thing, like how to solve the equations, how to converge, then you can control uh, those things. And then you can try 
a different solver and everything in order to make it work. So that's why it's stronger in this concept also. So you have the web page. If you go to download, so here it will tell you like some back background on the, uh, like how did it began and everything. It was like a PhD thesis and then it, it was developed. Ah, so I need to connect. <laughs> All right, one second. Yeah, I think I have some problem with my Wi-Fi, so that's why like uh, I turned it off and now I need to t restart my computer. Anyway, so you need to go and then you will need to download two things. It says like the, there's a specific procedure you need to follow and you have to follow it uh, rigorously like in order to have it installed correct. So uh, first you need to install what we call like the compiler which is uh, for, because this program is written with something that we call TCL language or the Tickle language, okay? Some kind of language similar to C++ and all those things. So this is how it's written. So you need to install the compiler first on your machine, okay? And you need to, uh, to install it actually in a specific location. If you read the instructions, it will tell you. And then after you do that, you download uh, and install like the openseas.exe the executable file this one which um, some of you like install and then when you, you click it so this is what you get it says like open seas open system this is the short it's open system for earthquake engineering simulation Uh, again, like this is with the peer uh, center, the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, and again, uh, the copyrights and everything. And then it says open seas, and now it's waiting for you to start writing the command in this tackle language to say, okay, now build whatever. Of course, we will not do it here in this black screen. We will do it in a text file. And then we would come here and we say, run this text file. So we write all the commands in this text file, which will be .tcl. So this you can write in any uh, text editor, notepad, whatever. All right, and then you would save it .tcl. And then at the end, you will come here. So this is the final one. This is the final file that we are going to run. I will explain what are the other ones. So this is the file. So I will come actually at the end and I will say source. So this is like run. This is the command. And then I will say the name open seas tutorial dot tcl. And then once I click enter, then it will start reading all the commands I wrote down in this file and then it will show me like some visualization what's happening, very basic visualization, and then uh, all the results will be saved, and then I can check them later, okay? All right, so now we need to go and write this input file with all those commands. So what you need to do, we have, okay, so we have First, we need to do, before you go and start building your structure and saying this is node number whatever, and this is the coordinates, this is element number whatever again, and this is connecting this point and this point, you need to make sure that you have all the names and the IDs for all the joints, right? So the first step you need to do is what we call structure idealization meaning that you will draw your structure and you will say, okay, this point, I will call it point one. This point, I will call it point two. This member, I will call it member number 12 or something. Okay. So this is the structure that we want to build. Again, two story, one bay, a moment frame, 
nothing strange about it okay so it's like this first story is like four and a half meter second story three and a half and a bay of six meters and then we have some sections those are w sections uh, those are like in north america so imagine if those are like ibe sections okay so the first thing i need to do is the frame idealization so what i'm doing here is what we call the concentrated plasticity approach in modeling the structure so what this means if you have a structure like this one like frame okay let's say you have fixed like this and then you will apply some kind of lateral force right Okay, you will apply some gravity, of course, like at the points, similar to what we did in SAP. But then you will apply some kind of lateral force or maybe do some dynamic analysis. So this frame, if I tell you, like, I apply some kind of force, lateral force like this F. So can you tell me how does the moment diagram looks like? So for this kind of frame, you will expect moment here, right? Like this. And then like this, and then the same, oh, sorry. So we have something like this. So this will be the moment diagram, right? So you have like, if I look at the column, if I look at the beam, the maximum moments are at the ends of the member, right? So if I increase this force, the first section to yield in each member will be where at the extremities right so i will develop either like yielding or uh, local buckling or whatever the failure mode or the nonlinear behavior that will happen it will happen always at the extremities like this in the same time the rest of the member or the rest of the element will remain Elastic, because let's say it, once you get the weak part here, everything will concentrate in this point or in this section, and the rest of the element will stay elastic. So this is what we do. Like for most for research, what you do is you say I will do it like this. This frame, I will do it using the concentrated plasticity approach, meaning I will model it in this way where those elements will be elastic elements. So I need to specify just the, maybe the area and the inertia and uh, Young's modulus E, that's it. They will remain elastic. There is no MY, there is no nothing like this. They will always stay elastic. And then at the ends, I need to assign what we call a nonlinear spring. So this spring will have specific uh, relation between the force and deformation, but this force deformation relation will be non linear because I know that at the end it will happen at those edges. Okay, so this is what we call the concentrated plasticity approach. The same thing you can do in SAP, like the, the example we did in SAP the other time. If you remember, like all the members we modeled, they were elastic, right? Everything was elastic. We didn't put like uh, a limit or something. So everything was elastic. In SAP, you can still select a member and then assign nonlinear springs at both ends. And then you can do this type of nonlinear analysis. But if you remember in SAP, we did everything we did was linear static analysis. There was no nonlinearity. If you want to include nonlinearity, then you will need to do something like this. What other options you can do? Well, there are other options like in open seas. And instead of modeling like line elements like this with the uh, concentrated uh, plasticity uh, nonlinear springs at the end, you can actually model the column as what we call fiber section. This means that you will actually model your actual cross section 
same like what we did in Abacus. But then you will have to divide it like similar to what we did in Abacus, like mesh elements. But here we call them fiber. So I can do it for the whole thing. Now the whole system is nonlinear. So the nonlinear behavior could occur wherever. It doesn't matter. So you can do this or you can do this. So what's the difference? Well, of course, if you do this thing, like if you model everything, like with fiber elements with the actual cross section, this uh, computation is more expensive. It will take much more time to run. However, if you do this one, it will be much faster to run. That's why like many people use it. And for most application like this one, where I know that the nonlinear behavior will occur at the extremities of the member, the difference in the results is not substantial. All right. Okay, any questions so far? Now, if you are doing this one, this means that for the nonlinear spring, you will need to define force deformation, some kind of relation between the force and the deformation for this spring. Now, since we are talking about moment frame, so the force is actually moment, and the deformation is actually rotation. So this spring, I'm telling you this spring, what's the relation between the moment and the rotation of the member? So I will have to specify some kind of bilinear or trilinear or even multilinear curve that describes this relation, okay? If you are modeling with the fiber section, then all you need to assign is the stress strain curve. So again, so here you will assign the stress strain curve. But for nonlinear springs, you will assign the, the component spring, which is the force deformation relation. So this is the difference between the two. Okay. Now, how can we get this curve? We'll say this in a second. All right. Okay. So, all right. So this is what I'm going to do for this uh, frame that we're going to model. So this is what ha what's happening here. Those springs, they are actually zero length. This means they are assigned to a given point. Okay. So this element, there should be an element here that will be assigned this spring. And this is a zero length element. It's basically, it has no length. It's two points on top of each other. Okay. Now for, for this, if I look at this connection at these joints and I make it like bigger, I'm actually doing some kind of offset for those springs. Because if you know, if I draw the whole thing like uh, it will be like this. I have the column. And then I have the beam like this. So the plastic hinge, when it occurs in the beam, like local buckling or yielding, it will happen at the face of the column, right? So it will happen here. And for the column, the same, it will happen here and it will happen here that's why like from this point at the center of the column i'm doing this offset so those rigid elastic elements so i put rigid elastic elements they are rigid so they are like rotating at the rigid body okay so this is to do the offset so that's why like, you have like this spring over here. It's like at half the depth of the column, correct? And those two springs, like again, half the depth of the beam to the top, half the depth of the beam to the bottom. So that, that's like, right. okay. All right, so once I did like this, now I have the idealization, then I need to name all those points that you see here. 
I need to give them names or IDs or tags. So if we go here to the next, okay, so here this is what I'm saying that for those nonlinear spring, we will actually assign a relation between the moment and rotation that we'll discuss in a second. Uh, and this is like how to get like those parameters just in a second. So if I go to here, so now this is what I'm doing. You can do something else, it's fine. So here I'm saying, okay, for the nodes, I'll not just give like some random uh, IDs, I'll have to follow a systematic procedure. So I'm saying like for the notation, for naming the nodes, I will specify the name of the node based on the floor number, then the axis number, then maybe some other number like depending, because we said like at any given joints, we have several numbers, right? So for example, if I look at the node here at the base, the one in red and black over here, so this is one, one, because this is floor one, axis one, correct? If I look at this one, this is floor three, axis two. All right, so this is how I do it. Now, for the other points that again on the same intersection, or on the same grid, but I have other points, so then I will start adding like some extra number to identify those points. So for example here, okay, so this point is 2, 1, correct? So now whenever I say point 2, 1, so now you know, ah, okay, this is the second floor, first axis. Okay, understand it. So now this point here, I call it 2, 1, 1, and then this one, 2, 1, 2, this one, two, one, three. And then the ones for the rigid uh, links, two, one, four, two, one, five, two, one, six, like in this, uh, in this direction. You can call them something different, it's up to you. You can call this node like one, two, three, or even you can call this 99 and this one four, up to you. There is no, uh, there is no specific like arrangement or anything, up to you. But again, you want to make it easy so that when you are checking your text file with all the numbers, you can easily know what's happening. All right. Okay, so this is for the nodes. Now I have all my numbers. I got it. Okay. Now I go to the elements. So again, for the elements, okay, that's easy. Any element is joining two points, right? So for the name of the elements, I just put the number of the first uh, node plus the number of the second node. So for example, like this nonlinear spring, it will be one, one, then one, one, three. All right? For this beam, for example, it's joining point two, one, two, and two, two, two. So two, one, two, two, that's it. Okay? So this is how I'm going to do it. So now I have it written. Then I can go and start building the geometry of my structure, the first step in OpenSea. All right. Okay. Okay. So if we go here to uh, so uh, yeah so uh, for the text editor actually I'm using uh, so this is Notepad plus plus. Okay. Like don't use Notepad like the the other one that you the typical one. You need to have like some more uh, professional. Uh, a note uh, text editor okay because now you will have like too many lines of code written and maybe uh, based on the language that you are writing you need to see like some different colors to make it easier to differentiate between the command and the values so at the end once we finish this is waiting to be filled all right it's not filled yet once we finish it will be like this so this is the completed code Don't worry, it's, it's much easier than it looks. You will see right now. Okay, so, so that's why like you need the professional like uh, code, like not plus plus, uh, like this one that I'm using here. You can still use not plus plus. Yeah, yeah, it's available. It's open source again uh, for free. 
some people use like uh, there is like this visual basic editor but i think this is uh, much easier and uh, i like it a lot so anyway so now again if you if you go here so what i have here is basically uh, like the basic steps of any model so whenever in in tcl or in tickle in this language if i want to add a comment like a comment line so it's not an actual code line it's just a comment so all you need to do is to put like the hashtag and then you write your comment so that's it this means that this line is a comment it's not actually a code line all right so what you see right now in this file these are all comments so I'm saying, okay, so this is like analysis of two-story moment resisting frame with concentrated plastic hinges. Okay, it's to, for today, like I'm using the units of kilonewton and millimeter. And then I have the steps that I will need to follow. First, I need to define the modeling space. I'm going to do similar to what we did in SAP, but I need to write it. So remember the first thing like in SAP to identify, are you working like in 3D or in 2D, right? So I need to say this, but in this language, the tackle language. Then I will need to start putting like input. So maybe like uh, the area and the inertia of the cross sections and so on. Uh, then I will need to define like uh, the nodes. So I need to write like node number, uh, whatever. This is the coordinates and so on. Then I need to define the rigid links, the columns and beam elements the plastic springs, the boundary conditions, and then the recorders. Those are pretty much uh, the results, like what I want to record, displacement of a specific uh, node, uh, the forces in a specific element. So I need to say this here. Nodal mass, assigning masses, if I'm doing eigenvalue uh, analysis, uh, statistic gravi uh, gravity analysis, the, lo the load cases, then push over analysis, and that's it. Okay. So I write it like this. You can do it something different. It doesn't matter. Maybe you don't have those things, but it's easier to follow when you have those sections written. Any questions? All right. So let's start first by defining the modeling space sourcing subroutines i will say what this is and then creating the result folder so we said like the first thing that you need to say uh, let me zoom a little bit so i need to say like am i am i doing like this frame in 2d or in 3d if i'm doing in 2d then i have how many degrees of freedom at any point three, three. x y and rotation right x y and rotation if I'm doing in 3D, then I have six, correct? Three translations and three rotations. So in order to do this, so this is the command that you use here. So it's called model basic builder. Now again, don't worry about this because like again, online, if you go to the command manual, it says like all those things like how to start your thing. You will have many examples, like the ones we are going to do today. We can share this file after we finish uh, the tutorial, that's fine. So here I'm saying model, basic builder, so this is the command. And then again, this is also part of the command and this is part of the command. The only variables I need to put is the number of degrees of freedom, uh, sorry, the, uh, the number of dimensions and the number of degrees of freedom. So I put two here and three for the degrees of freedom. All right. So that's it. So now the program knows that anything that you are going to put, like any nodes, those are all has the, those properties, three degrees of freedom. So you can't come like later on and say, okay, assign to this point, like some rotation around uh, some axis in the in the other dimension it will say okay now you have a problem okay now 
the next thing you need to define also at the beginning or you can do it later it doesn't matter but uh, we can do it at the beginning which is what we call the geometric transformation and again this thing like if you remember in SAP uh, you remember when we said if you are doing nonlinear analysis and you need to include like uh, P delta effects and Professor Linus like said like P delta effects what, what does it mean it means that you, you do the equilibrium in the deformed position so now you take the effects of like any axial force or any vertical force you take the moment coming from it all right so in order to do this so the command is geometric transformation this one in the beginning and then you have like three options there is like the p delta there is like co-rotational and there is linear okay now linear if you don't if you want to exclude the p delta effect if you want to include p delta you put it like this p delta co-rotational this is what you use pretty much if you have like uh, braces or something like this so you need to put like this co-rotation but for now for this example we just stick with p delta so this is what you need to specify and then i put this value so this is just again id or a tag for this transformation so it could be any number so it could be like uh, any unique number but for here i just put it like one it doesn't matter much easier because later on whenever i uh, model uh, an element like for the beams and the columns i need to assign to this element the geometric transformation so i will tell it use the geometric transformation number one which is already here declared as the p delta transformation okay all right now for the second thing here which is what we call uh, there is also like this line at the beginning which is called like wipe all this is only to clear the space uh, of the of your program from any previously defined variables but for us okay it doesn't matter here it's uh, we didn't model anything from before but just in case this is like the first line we always put like in any type of code like this just to clear uh, the memory for from any previously uh, declared variables so that's it this is defining the modeling space the 2d or 3d and the geometric trans transformation sourcing subroutines so in order to call it so i need to define it in the beginning of the program so this is called source again it's similar to run so we say source and then i say the name of the subroutine phi okay now those two those are actually ones that you will find uh, on open seas they are available so those two subroutine are intended for the visualization after we write the code of what's happening in the structure so those are written by the developers of open seas in order to visualize what's happening so later on i will need to say display model 2d like later on in the model after i build it i will say display model 2d and then i will need to specify some parameters like uh, the scale of the window and like the scale factor of the deformed shape and so on all right i can source other things it depends but for us for now that's it then the last part we have to do is creating the result folder you will have some files that will be generated we will ask ask the program to like save uh, the results so those files where are you going to save it now if you go to the like this folder that we have the the text file if i just run it right now if i have everything ready and i just run it all the files will appear here the text files now if you want to create like some new folder and then save the results inside so you can do this actually in the program so in the tickle language you just say file this is the command mkdir which is make directory 
and then I will call it results PO push, push over. All right? So that's it. <coughs> Actually, if I take this one, for example, if you want to see what's happening here, if I go to, uh, if I open the, this folder, and if I open this one, and then I come here, so control V and I say enter. So you see what's happened? So now it executed this this line. So now you have it here. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. So that's it. So now we have. Okay. This is the first part. It's pretty easy. We did it. Those are pretty much the things that you will always have the same lines of code for any frame. So this is not like something that you need to reinvent. Now for the input. Okay, so later on we'll have, we need some input like for the material, right? We need to define like the material, like E, the Young's modulus, Fy, uh, the yield stress. Uh, you need to define the area, inertia, all those things, uh, material proper, uh, the, the cross-section of dimensions of the beams and the column. So if you want to define, so you need to define a variable. So the command is like this. Let's say I want to define E, Young's modulus. So I say set, this is the command. And then I say, let's say uh, Young's modulus, so E, I call it E. So this is the name of the variable. And then I need to put the value. So as we said, we are going to use kilonewton and millimeter. So this means I come here and I say, if you calculate this with kilonewton millimeter, it will be 210. Okay, that's it. Then let's say Fy, I call it Fy, you can call it whatever. So again, it has to be kilonewton millimeter square. So I think it's like 0.355. Okay, then what else? Okay, so this is the material. Uh, what else do we need to define? Okay, let's say uh, for uh, for the column section. Okay, so let's put a comment, for example, like this. Column dimensions or section properties. And then I start saying set. Okay, so if I go back to the thing here. So I have the column is all the same. It's W24 by 131 or maybe IBE 600 or something. Then you know the properties. You know the area. You know the inertia. You know the uh, plastic modulus or the elastic modulus S or Z or W as you have it here in uh, Europe. Then you need to start defining. So I say like set. Now the name of the variable. I'll call it like area of the column. And then I would put the value, let's say point something. That's it. And then I copy this thing, and then maybe I'll put like another one, the inertia IX of the column, and put the value in millimeter. Okay? And I keep going with other pro the properties, maybe the depth, the thickness of the flange. Well, the ones that I will need later. So it depends. You don't need to define everything. The one that you will need <coughs> later on uh, when you are defining the members. So actually, if I go here, I can copy this right away. So that's it, like column section properties. Okay, so I have the area of the column in millimeter square. So this is the value. Energy of the column. Uh, Z, the plastic modulus of the column. Uh, D, the depth, B flange, T flange, T web, uh, RY, radius of gyration, and then length of the column. Again, those are things, actually it's not area, it's the length, but okay, those are things that I will use later on. Okay. So I define this for the column and I define the same for the beam. Okay, and as you see here, the material properties are already defined. Okay, 
something I defined over here, but uh, let's say if we will need it. So now let's go to the next one, pre-calculations. Well, let's say we don't have any pre-calculations. Let's just go right away to the grid uh, and main nodes. So create the grid and main nodes and the plastic hinge nodes. So the command here is node and then the ID and then I need to give the X coordinate and the Y coordinate. So if we go back to this one, so let's say we want to define, for example, 0.11. So this means that I will need to come here and I say node 11. What's the X coordinate? Zero and the Y coordinate zero. That's it. Uh, I have the next node on the other axis. Uh, it's called node one, two, right? See now, if you have a system for naming, it will be much easier. You don't need to keep looking at the original file. Actually, we can, we can write it on the same line. That's why it's also very useful to use like this semicolon. Because the semicolon, it ends the command. So you can write another one. So this way it becomes very easy because I can consider like this one, the first axis and this is the second axis. So now node one, two, X zero and, uh, sorry, X 6,000 because it's millimeter and Y is equal to zero, right? Let's put the other points. So this is one, let's go to the top floor. So I can copy this paste it like this and now all I need to do is like two and here two and here this value only will change will become uh, I don't know the, the first story was like uh, 4.5 meter so see it becomes much easier and then if you have like 100 <coughs> stories then you can like uh, do multiple lines and then you just come like this, three, four, five, and so on. All right. Now, if I do this and, uh, okay, so we don't have all of those. We actually have, like, that's it. So three, one, and then 4,500, and the next one is like 3.5. So total of like 8,000 or 8 meter. And here, uh, those are the same, like this. And then you can probably uh, maybe like move it like this. So it's easier to, if you have like a, some problem, you will see it. It's like looking into the matrix, you know? So, all right. Uh, so that's it, you have it like this, and then oh, this is three, two. Now the problem, let's say we did this. And maybe we have like more number of stories, like 10 or 12 or maybe 20. And then you said, ah, you know, I did a mistake. The first story, it was not 4.5 meter, it was like 4 meter. Then <laughs> you will come and do everything like for the 10 lines. So it's easier to actually come in the beginning act again and make everything like generalized. Meaning that I will come here. So those are the lines here. I will come at this point in this input and I will actually define some things. I will say, okay, now the number of story is two variables, new variables. Uh, number of bays, one. The bay width is like 6,000. First story, H story one, 4.5. H story typical or T, three, five, zero, zero. And then I will come in the pre-calculations and then I will define the axis. So meaning that I will say set axis one as zero. Okay. And the axis two is how much? 
No, axis two will will define the x coordinate pretty much. It's like the x coordinate. So axis two, the bay width is six thousand. But I will not write six thousand. I will say bay width. But in order to do it like this, if you want to say like this variable is equal to the other variable, you need to put s dollar like this. You see now the color changed because I put the s dollar. That's why like in Note++, plus plus, if you actually come here and then you come to the language, if you go to the T, so I have it declared as <coughs> tickle language. That's why like there is a difference in colors between the commands and the variables and everything. If this is a different uh, code, maybe if I'm somebody who's like programming in like uh, C++ plus plus or something, so I will say C++ plus plus and then Note plus, uh, notepad will know that I'm doing in C++, so it will start making some different colors for different commands, all right? That's why it's good to use. So now when I say this, when I come to the a node, so instead of saying uh, 0, 0, 0, I will say axis 1. And I put the Okay, so I do it like this. And then for those, I can go again and I put axis, axis two. Okay, so the same. For the floors, again, maybe I come here for the pre-calculations and let's define for the floors. So floor one. So this will be zero, always. Okay, then floor two. This will be equal to, so let's make it generalized. So I need to say it will be equal to floor one plus H story one, right? Correct? And then if I go to floor three, it will be floor one plus H story one plus H story typical multiplied by one. If you want to be consistent, you can make it like this. So this is plus multiplied by zero. Make sense? And then I can put again like, uh, so this is floor three. And then I can put again floor four, the same. So this is multiplied by two. So, so what did we do right now? Okay, if we go here now, so instead of writing like this, I will come, take those, and this will be floor one, like this, with a dollar sign, and this will be floor two, floor three. Now after I did this, Let's say we did this mistake that we said, like it was 4.5 meter, but actually no, it was four. So all you need to do is to come here, change the number, that's it. Okay, it takes a little bit of time at the beginning because you need to do like all those new lines for the pre-calculation. But later on, if you want to fix something in the code, it becomes much easier. Okay? Is it clear? All right, so, so that's it. We have the nodes, so those are like the main nodes. And then you need again to define the other nodes. So let's say like, let me take those here to show it to you like, so this is like the grid lines. Ah, let's, let me, ah, I forgot to tell you. So this is how we wrote it, right? But if you want to do uh, a mathematical uh, equation, like addition or subtraction or like division or something like this. So you need to do 
square bracket at the start, square bracket at the end, and then you come here and you write XPR or expression, and then a space. And then of course you need to put dollar sign before each of those variables like this. Okay. Now, if I'm just declaring like just single va uh, value, or like uh, this variable is equal to this variable, like just floor floor three is equal to floor one, then this will be enough. But then if I want to say it's equal to floor one multiplied by two or plus something else or like some kind of formula, then you need to do it like this. This is the way this language works. So again, if I take those ones that I already defined, and here. You don't need to define floor one at the beginning and then the other. What do you mean? Because when you compute, you mm -hmm. came to floor three, and there is floor one in the expression before the variables. Ah, from the previous, uh, yeah, 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 that's true. This is much easier, of course, because floor one, we know it's always zero, right? Okay. So that's why, like he said, like in the previous one that you wrote, you had floor one, but you didn't need to. Yeah, that's true. It's always zero. So I don't need to put it in the uh, equation. I think, I think what he means is like, because in MATLAB, if you call a variable, after, uh, you have to decipher it, and then you call it. Ah, yes, and... yes, that's true. They are saying like the hierarchy, like how it's written. Yeah, for sure. So because here, yeah, I'm saying, Floor two is equal to floor one, but actually floor one at this point, it was not defined because I define it here. That's true. Good observation. So that's why like in the one I pasted already uh, here, yeah, I'm saying like floor one is equal to zero, but it's not used before. So that's why, but that's good. Yeah. So of course you can't call a variable unless you already uh, define it from before because it goes like line by line. Like this. <coughs> Ah, you see like here, like for x is 1, then x is 2 is using x is 1 <coughs> plus something. All right? Okay, so now let's say we want to define like something else. Uh, if we want to define, for example, okay, and now you tell me, like uh, let's say point... Uh, Two, 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 this one. Okay. So we need to define this point or this point because point two, two, two is the same as point two, two, five, right? They have the same coordinates because in between them there will be a, a zero length element, correct? So let's define this one. So node. 2, 2, 2. So, which axis? It's axis 2. Which floor? Floor 2. Uh, we always call like the yeah. ground is like floor 1. All right? Uh, or you can make it different. You can say the ground floor 0. But this is the typical like in the engineering community. Like this is how you do it. So, floor 2. That's it. Actually, it was not axis 2. There is an offset, right? So it's axis 2 minus half the depth of the column. Do you remember? <coughs> so there is like, uh, there is this offset. Here. So from axis 2, we need to subtract half the depth of the beam, correct? So I come here and then, okay, so it will be axis two minus half multiplied by the depths of the beam or whatever I called it in the beginning, D beam. All right. And then I need to put the square brackets because this is an expression. Now, if you did like some mistake here and this is like pretty common because like it never works from the first time. Once you click run, you will have some errors. 
but then it will tell you, okay, you have this error in this expression, and then you go fix it, and then it will tell you another error, then you go fix it, and so on and so on, until you get uh, like this window and it works, okay? But again, uh, you have to do like some debugging before like this actually this thing like actually works. But you will see like after you learn this one, it's, you will find that it's uh, really. Uh, but when it comes to research or like in uh, rigorous nonlinear analysis, it's much better, of course, than SAP. Okay. And if you know it, you have like uh, an edge over like somebody else who finished the bachelor and maybe he learned SAP like in uh, some kind of design office, but he doesn't know open seas. Now, if you go work and they need, they have like this special, special structure and they need to do like some nonlinear time history analysis. Now you can do it, all right? And with the navigator, maybe it becomes for you much easier because it will be similar to SAP, but with more options, all right? Okay, so that's it. So if I copy all of those here, So you see, it's only like one line, and then you start copy, paste, copy, paste, and then change numbers. So this is it at the end. Like offset nodes, column plastic inch, and you try to be like uh, as organized as possible. Because if you have some problem, then you can fix it. Because when you do this, copy, paste, copy, paste, maybe in some of those, like you have small mistake like this. And this small mistake, or maybe not something like this. If I did, uh, I don't know, like one or something. Very small mistake. And then the program will have problem like <coughs> converging, but it won't tell you that it has problem. Because now this point, maybe somewhere else by itself, <coughs> away from the structure, nothing connected to it. So you don't know what's happening. It's actually there, but it's not an issue with the code. And now you need to find it. So if you have everything like organized like this, it becomes much easier to say uh, 0 0.50. Ah, here, how come all of those are zero and this is one? So it's easy to see, right? So that's why I try to be organized and I try to like keep moving like with the space and tap like to align everything like this. At the same time, and this you will like, in Notepad, Let's say access one, ah, oh, this is wrong. It's actually access two. So should you come like at each one and start? And I don't know if you have like a 20 story, you need to do it like this. No. In Word, maybe in Notepad, yes. But here in uh, this one, you just click Alt. And you click and you select. And then you are writing on the whole four lines. The same thing goes with copying and pasting. It's like you are working with Excel now. Like you have cells. This is how it works. So it becomes very easy to modify or do something like more systematic. Is it possible to make loops? Make loops, yes. Ah, so this language, okay, it's similar to MATLAB. If you're familiar with MATLAB, you, you have like the for statement, you have the if statement, but for uh, what you are doing today, you will not go through it. But yeah, you can actually do it. Yep. So again, you can come here and again with Alt, you can copy those, Control C or something, and then come here, select Control V, and that's it. Okay. Let's bring it back to the. <coughs> well, it doesn't matter anyway. So. We will run the other one. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So we have now the points. Okay. We have the joints. Now we move to the elements, right? So we have the rigid links, the elastic beams and column elements, and we have the nonlinear springs. So let's start with the easiest, the rigid links. Okay. So I need to assign, remember in SAP, it was like an elastic beam column element, right? So here again, this is one of the many uh, elements available in OpenSeas. And it's called, so this is the command element. 
and this is the name of the element in the element library and there are too many elements so this is called elastic beam column and then you as a user need to identify give it an id say the nodes that this column is joining so node one node two and then this is an elastic beam column you only need to specify the area the elastic modulus and the inertia right if you are doing in 3d then you will need to define like the inertia in the two direction right because now it becomes three-dimensional so you will need ix and iy or like in europe you have it like iz and iy so let's put okay let's say we are trying to define <clears throat> let's say i don't know any any element you choose so let's say like this one the one joining it's a rigid one right so the one joining point 21 and point 215 okay so all i need to come and i say the name we say it will be like 21 215 the number of the first node the number of the second node so the first node is 21 the second node is 215 the geometric transformation we said p delta and i specified uh, the tag one right so here i put one so this is the tag <coughs> the geometric transformation if you remember at the beginning we defined the geometric transformation as p delta and we gave it an id of one if you want something else you can call it like give it 99 or something and then here you will say 99 okay now area well e the mo elastic modulus okay i just need to put the dollar sign because now this is the value of the variable i'm recalling so i need to put the dollar sign now area and inertia what's the area and inertia well we said it's what we said it's rigid elastic element so if i want to make those elements rigid in both axially and in flexure so i need to assign it a very large area and a very large inertia similar to the set modifiers in sap remember the set modifiers in sap so i need to modify those because those elements I just need them to move like a rigid body and there is no any kind of deformation happening in them okay they are just for offset so this means i need to give it a very large area so let's say how much large should we put like something ridiculous like this no you don't do it because like when you put like very very large numbers or very very small numbers like zero then because at the end this thing it will go into the background and it will start doing like some uh, structure matrices and then it will start solving and then whenever it's subtract by zero or multiply by a very large number it will have some errors so you need it to be large okay relative to the other elements so how much okay let's say like if i look at the area for all the elements that i have in my uh, model so this is like uh, 6,000 around 6,000 and this one 25,000 so you need to do it like 100 or 1,000 time magnitude more than the largest that you have so if I have here 25,000 maybe I come here and say 25 okay thousand I add couple more zeros 100 times more that's it so relative to the others, it's more rigid. You're not f feeling very comfortable with this one? Okay, let's put another zero, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay? But again, like nothing. Uh, uh, the inertia, again, you will do the same. Look at the numbers, multiply by 100 or something, and that's it. Okay? So that's it, now it's rigid. So now I need to do it like the same for all the rest of the elements. So if I come here, so that's it. So 
so this is at x is one all those ones here and then if you go here those are at x is two so if you do x is one and then copy and paste here and just to change the the one value to two the one value to two it will become very easy and now you know this trick with the uh, notepad okay any questions all right now for the beams and column the elastic members so those are basically the same the same command it's elastic beam column but this time i need to specify the actual values so it will not be like this very large area no it will be the area if this is like a column member so this will be the area of the column and for the i okay it will be the i of the column that's it and of course don't forget the dollar sign yes you have originally an x on the floor one between the uh no because do you? You don't. Because like this is like you have the base plate or something, and this is right uh, on the ground. So you understand why we did the offset, right? We said because you have the beam and column, and the plastic hinge is occurring like at this point. Maybe you have the plastic hinge for some reason, like if you are doing like a brace, the brace would buckle, and all the nonlinear behavior will be in the center of the brace once it buckles. So maybe you want to put uh, the spring in the center of the end. But actually for braces, uh, we use typically uh, fiber elements like this. Because you need to capture all what's happening along the member. Okay. But you can still do this. Like in the same model, you can have another member that's uh, fiber. Like that's fiber based. Can we have the yeah, two yeah, 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 the two of them. One. Yes. Actually, we were going to put this one, but then just to try to not to make everything complicated. But when we do it, we actually have a subroutine for building uh, the brace element. So you will just need to say it will be the name of the subroutine, like uh, Seung Hoon. What's the name of the subroutine for building uh, the brace? The one that you have mm -hmm. to build the brace fiber element mm -hmm. for a brace you have a subroutine right the one with the number of uh, like fibers across the section and so on yeah anyway yeah so it's like build a <laughs> long time ago okay so maybe like build the brace or something whatever you call it and then you will need to give it like the dimension of the brace right and uh, the material properties and the points you are joining and then it will do all this discretization of the section and everything else okay so you can use actually something somebody else have done because here you are actually using a subroutine when i'm saying like elastic beam column this is actually subroutine that has like this long code of defining this material okay anyway all right so columns and beams so we come here again so here are columns and beams the one after you define like this now this 1.1 that you see here I will discuss in a second what's happening all right now we go to the plastic springs and those are the one of the most important because this is where the nonlinear behavior will happen so you need now to define uh, this curve that you have so I'm using this material model there are many ones there is like bilinear you have bilinear ones and if you are doing a bilinear uh, spring then all you need to define is like this point how much is the moment how much is the rotation and then that's it because after this point 
maybe you have like a perfectly plastic, so it's going like uh, horizontal. If you have, it goes like this, bilinear also, but like, like this, and then you have a slope, some hardening happening, strain hardening. Then you will need to define again some moment, maybe MY or MP of the cross section, the corresponding rotation. And then you will need to define the slope of the uh, second line of the strain hardening, right? Now for this one, if you do like uh, elastic per perfectly plastic or like uh, something with strain hardening, all of those, they don't deteriorate, meaning that beyond yielding, the strengths keep going up or maybe stays as it is, like, but never goes down. So if you want to bring it down, you need multilinear, like trilinear or something like this. So for this purpose, I want it to go down. I want to simulate strength deterioration because we said like this program, you can do like significant nonlinear analysis when the structure is really uh, deformed. So I need some curve like this, like this, some strain hardening at, at one point, pretty much like for beams and columns. This is when like local buckling happens. The strengths will start going down. So for this one, I'm using uh, this material. It's called uh, in the library. It's called uniaxial material by lin. It's called bilinear, but it's not bilinear, but it's multilinear. But this is how it's called. And this material model, it's based on like this paper by, uh, it's called the IMK model, Ibarra, Medina, Krawinkler, like those are the name of the three who published the paper. And then it was later modified by Professor Lignons, like in this paper, Lignons and Krawinkler, 2011. And actually, uh, to calculate all those parameters, like uh, you need to go in this paper and then you have like some equations okay before we go to this we need to define this line right this one two three ignore this part we have one two three so in order to define it you need to know what is this value okay which actually will use like mp which is the plastic modulus multiplied by fy and then you need to know this value, and this is what we call theta p, or the plastic rotation. Then you will need also to define ke, the elastic stiffness. You need to define this alpha s, which is basically the slope of this second line. You need to define, uh, sorry, this is theta p, uh, modify this in your slide. This is called theta y the yield rotation, and this is theta p. Just modify this in your slides. So you need to define this theta p, and then you need to define this theta p c, or what we call post-capping rotation. Post-capping plastic rotation, actually, to be specific. So this is where the strength hits zero. So if you go into this paper, or if you go to this online tool, but unfortunately now because I have the internet off, if you go to this one, you can actually specify the, so it gives you how much is theta p and how much is theta p c based on the dimensions of your cross section. Not only this, it's based on the dimension of the cross sections, on the material property, FY, and on the member property, like the length of the, the slenderness of the member and so on. So how did they come with those equations? Like it's like imp uh, empirical equations. They're done from regression analysis. So for this, like Professor Lignos like collected like um, 300 or more than 300 like sets of moment rotation like this one, cyclic tests on uh, beams and then from all those beams, he tried to uh, fit or calibrate 
this material model against the experimental data. So the experimental data was shown here in blue, and the simulation in open seas is the one shown in red. And what you are defining here is pretty much the black line. So he did this like for the 300 plus sets of moment rotation like this. So now he got like some correlation between how much is this like theta p or how much is this theta p c with respect to the cross section and the material property and the member dimension and so on. So you just need to go into this equation, put down like the depth of the beam or the depth of the column and all of those things, and then you will get how much is theta p. You don't have time to do this, that's fine. You can just go to this online tool. I don't know if you tried it yet, after you got the slides anyway, you should just click and then you will go, then you will need to specify all of those things, like what's the section, and then it will give you right away this, this is what we call the backbone curve. So this is what we call a monotonic backbone curve. All right. Yes, so you see this is the online tool. And then if you can go down, then you can specify how much is the material properties and so on. And then you say plot, and then it will give you uh, the backbone curve. Okay, now if you look here again to define this one, I need to specify the ID of the spring or the element, doesn't matter. KE, the elastic stiffness, so this you need to calculate. So for our frame, what's the elastic stiffness for the beams and columns? For the beams, do you know how much is the flexure elastic stiffness? of the beams. Remember, like something EI over L, right? So how much? Remember, like those things like uh, 12 EI over L, 6 EI over L? Yeah, anyway, okay, maybe you don't uh, remember it right now, but pretty much when you are using it a lot, you need to know it. So if I have a frame element fixed on both uh, ends, like the beam, it's in double flexure, so it's 6 EI over L. But this is the flexural elastic stiffness. So this is what relates the moment and the rotation. Okay, 6 EI over L. And for the columns, we'll use the same. But actually, maybe for the column, if you look here, like in this one, this figure I have here, it's not actually, uh, it's fixed fixed because you have moment at both ends, right? But the fixation is not the same because at the top, it's not the same flexibility at the base. The base is totally fixed. At the top, there is some flexibility. So that's why what we call the inflection point where the moment is equal to zero, it's not in the center. If it's in the center, then it's 60i over L. Okay? Uh, if it's at the end, this inflection point, this means it's cantilever, and it becomes 3 EI over L. Uh, sorry, it becomes 12 EI over L. Now, if it's something in between, so it will be something in between. But for now, we'll just assume it's fixed on both symmetric, I mean, like the boundary condition, so it will be 6 EI over L. Okay? Anyway, so pretty much you need to calculate this stiffness and add it here and then you need to say how much this alpha s from key is so this is pretty much it's in the range uh, for this type of components like beams and columns so this is around three percent of ke so it will be 0.03 but here if you if you look closely we have two alpha s and we have two mp 2 theta p, 2 theta p c. From everything, we have 2. Why? Because we are doing this in the positive direction and in the negative direction. Okay? Because this model can actually simulate asymmetric cyclic behavior. 
So you could have the parameters on one direction different than the other loading direction. So, okay, anyway, for us, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. Anyway, we are doing push over. So we are only pushing in one direction. So those two values will be the same. MP, again, MP plus and MP minus, okay? In the positive direction and here in the negative direction. Then theta P, theta PC, we said from the regression equation. Then we have those two, what we call MR, or the residual moment. So pretty much what happens here, like for any type of like loading like this, uh, what will happen that uh, after a specific rotation, the moment rotation curve starts to stabilize. This means that it will not keep going down the strands. No, it will start hitting a plateau. And it will stay on this plateau until like fracture or something else happens due to fatigue. So this plateau from like, again, from uh, experimental uh, uh, data that we have from full testing of this kind of components, this, if you look in the paper, you will say, it will tell you this is around 0.4. So at around 0.4 of MP, you will hit this plateau. Okay, so again, theta ultimate, we said like, okay, once you hit this plateau and then you keep going at one point, you will get fracture. Okay, so that's why we put this theta ultimate. How much is it? Around 20% radian in rotation or 25% radian in rotation. Now, okay, those numbers maybe for you now doesn't make sense, but once you start reading more about uh, like... Uh, how beams behave, how much ductility or plastic rotation capacity do they have, when do they fracture and everything, those uh, numbers will start getting, become familiar, okay? So yeah, we put like 20%. So this like theta PC is not actually like, this is not what will happen, like it will not come to this point, it will probably fracture before that, all right? Anyway, so that's it. This is how you define this model. Uh, of course, if you are using, we said like bilinear, you just uh, specify two or three values and that's it, you're done. What are those ones? The one I have here in like uh, violet color, like those one, 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 one. So those, if you go to the documentation, again, on the website for open seas, so those values specify how much cyclic deterioration happens because all what we defined so far is the backbone curve this is if i'm doing something monotonic like i'm keep pushing like this but if i'm pushing like this and then coming back cyclic so this will happen you will have cyclic deterioration in strength you will have cyclic deterioration in stiffness the stiffness of the column will start being reduced because you will have probably lateral torsional buckling and things like that. Okay. But for us, since those are not like of importance for uh, for now for this tutorial, so I just put all of them equal to one. Otherwise, you will need to start putting like some numbers to specify how fast uh, does your uh, component deteriorate in strength or stiffness. Okay. Okay, so if I go back here, and then, so this is like for one element, so th the one joining 314 and 311, so this is like in the first axis, the second story column. Uh, so again, joining this number and this number, and, uh, sorry, this is uh, not the second story column, sorry. This is like the second floor, first axis spring in the column. So here I need to, I'm saying this element is a zero length element. Okay. This is the ID of the element. It's joining this point and this point. And it's assigned this material, one, one, one. 
we'll see what this is and this material which is defined the moment rotation it's assigned to direction number six what does this mean if we go a step back so this is where I defined the uni axial material the one that we just discussed and then you specified like the K of the column I have the K of the columns calculated here 60 I over L the this is alpha s the strain hardening I call it here B and then uh, like my of the column in the positive direction in the negative direction it has a negative sign and as well as the rest of the parameters actually if we go like this so I have here uh, those should be the same so I have here the plastic rotation is like uh, 0.02 and 0.02 then the post the theta PC it's 0.15 and 0.15 you don't need to put signs here for this one uh, this is the residual moment we said like around 0.4 theta ultimate 0.2 and 0.2 so what we defined here is a material right so it's a material model or a component model now this one need to be assigned to a member or an element okay so that's why like here I'm saying now the element now I'm defining the element it's a zero length element this is the command its ID is 314311 it's joining node 314 and node 311 and the material assigned to this zero length element is this one 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 this is the tag I give it you could uh, do another one direction now here I'm saying okay so now it got like this values like for uh, it doesn't know its moment rotation or is it uh, shear force shear deformation the program doesn't know so you need to say this backbone that you defined you should assign it to what exactly to which degree of freedom so we have we said like in this program we have how many degrees of freedom three in total we have six and those six the id is one two three four five six right mm -hmm. so so if you have like uh, if this is like the 2d space that you are working on so this is x and this is y and this is the rotation that we have which is basically the rotation around z Now transition X, this is one, similar to SAP, right? And similar to Abacus also. Transition Y, it has the number two. Transition Z, which we don't have here, three. And then RX, which we don't have here, is four. RY, which we don't have here, is five. And then the last one is six. That's why here, I say, direction is six all right any questions for this one okay and that's it so that's it so again if i control c control v so this is what's happening okay so you will notice something different here so K, you see when I'm defining the K, I'm not saying it's 6 CI over L. I'm saying it's, I multiply by 10, right? I did this multiplication by 10. And from the, the part from before, like I actually multiplied by 1.1, the inertia of the column. And here when I'm calculating like this alpha S, the strain hardening slope, I start adding like those uh, strange uh, like factors so what's happening okay so in SAP this thing like is done in the background and you don't need to do it but here when you are using this type of elements 
natural. In the beginning, you had just one element, and this element had an inertia of 60 i over l, right? Now we broke down this element into, like, let's say, like this one. We broke down into an elastic element and two nonlinear springs. So what we need to do is to make the inertia, uh, sorry, the stiffness of this new element, we have to make it the same with the original one. So if this was 60i over L, because now you have like three elements connected in series. So if you have two members connected in series, their inertia, uh, their uh, stiffness becomes different than just one single member. So that's why like you have this 10, it's called the N modification. Okay, so you have this modification that we do here, multiply here by 10, and then multiply here by 10 plus uh, one over 10, which is like 1.1. Anyway, but don't just like uh, don't get confused by this one so there is a paper okay there is a paper that uh, I don't know if I have it here but I can edit in this text uh, file so this paper you can check it and it says like how to do this modification it's pretty easy so you just need to multiply the stiffness of the nonlinear springs by this modification factor n that's equal to 10 and then when you are calculating this strain hardening, you didn't need to do this again like some kind of modification with this factor n. Okay? I don't know actually if they're now they have like some kind of uh, probably they did like some kind of modified uh, member that automatically automatically takes consideration of this parameter in the formulation. So you don't need to multiply by 10 and then Inside here, it will take the value and multiply it by 10 by itself. But so far, you need to do it yourself, okay? Anyway, don't worry about this one. Like this modification factor, again, it's, it's in this paper. You don't need to read the paper. You can just uh, apply it like I have it here, okay? At the end, you have to... The, the second element, mm -hmm. so the... Elastic element with the two strings. Yes. The zero As length? The, the stiffness of mm -hmm. this element mm -hmm. is the same stiffness of the beam alone. In the yes, yes. Okay. That's why like, you need to do this modification factor. After you do this and then you run it, you will find that everything was correct. Okay? Otherwise, you will have a very different overall stiffness of the structure. Okay? Uh, now this modification, okay, here I, I just write 10. I probably like, I uh, should have uh, wrote it like with respect to N, like first I define like N is equal to 10 or something. And then here I make everything with respect to N. So this becomes like N like this. And here this is like, again, N. Ah, so yeah, here if you go, uh, yeah, so this is the paper. Ibarra and Krawinkler, 2005. Similar examples, like similar to the one I'm doing today, you will find on uh, the OpenSeas uh, webpage. There are many examples, okay? And this is similar to one of them, but we are doing it in steps. <laughs> Ah. Good time. How confused are you? <laughs> very, very. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So now we're done. We did all the elements. So now we need to go to the boundary condition part. Okay. So if you look at uh, our structure here. Okay. So you have, we have fixed support. So we need to assign this boundary condition to this node and this node. So that's easy. I have only two nodes, so I need to come here. And then the command that we use is called fix. Uh, 
let's copy it from here. So this is the command. I say fix, and then I specify the ID of the node. So let's say the first node is 1,1, one, one, we said. And then we said we have three degrees of freedom because it's a two-dimensional uh, space. So we have UX, UY, and RZ. So what do you need to do? Do you need to release or fix? We need to fix the three of them, X, Y, and the rotation. So all you need to do is to put one corresponding to each one of those. So one means fixed. It's fixed. If you put zero, yeah. it's released. So if I put here zero for the rotation, so now it becomes a pinned support. If I put uh, zero for X also, it becomes the roller support. Right? So this is more of a convention. Like yeah. Somebody could have called it, uh, I guess, A, B, A is fixed, B is pin. Yes. So for, for instance, sorry for the for thing. Like for instance, when, you, when you're inside, you select the node and you say, you click fixed, what the interface does, it writes a file on the back, like this one. When you click fixed, it says, you know, node, 11, 1, 1, 1. So right now, you, we don't use an interface. So that's really the difference. Yes. So, he, what basic, so what we are doing here, if you think about SAP, in SAP, first you define the geometry, he did it. Then you draw how the elements are linked, he did it, but, at the same, but before he does it, he actually said what kind of elements he needs. Okay, so in SAP, when you picked a beam and you said, you know, this one should be this, because you have a graphical end user interface, um, you just pick it, you do it here, you don't have a graphical end user interface, but technically what SAP does, it writes a file on the back that it's like this one, and each step that you are applying, basically there's some kind of notation that you don't see. Now, the reason why we want to torture ourselves is because SAP cannot do a reasonably well nonlinear analysis. And even if you know it has some features, the problem with these features is that, for instance, if you have, uh, say, you know, a new connection versus uh, an existing connection that we see, say, you know, in a school, or like a new connection we see, like, you know, in a, in a modern uh, building, this program gives us the flexibility to model whatever we want. So it gives us the, the flexibility to basically uh, model whatever performance we want. Yep. Or if you want to add thermal load, the same story. So the confusion is normal, okay, because you are not used on the syntax yet. But if you try to build a very trivial example, and okay, of course you see what he did, you will see that, you know, things are really making sense. Okay. Now, one good, uh, one other good reason why you want to be in this logic is because this logic helps you understand your statics. Like, once when you define a spring, you need to define an elastic stiffness. So, if you have a element in double curvature, by statics, you should know that the rotational stiffness is like 6 CI over L. I mean, obviously, maybe you don't remember it by heart, but if you do it, say, you know, one or two times, you will remember it by heart. Or if it's like a thin thing and it rotates, then it's 2 EI, 2 EI over L. Okay, so with this thing, this will uh, help you refresh your memory in statics because uh, you will be able to, because you are defining things, you you need to somehow figure out how these things are coming from. Okay, so it might seem a little bit tricky now, but believe me, it's not going to be tricky. A plus where help you. Okay. All right. So relax. <laughs> you know, relax. Okay. Okay. So here, okay, so that's it. Like you fixed like point one one. You will do the same with the one on the other axis. So can do it like this, so this, the other point, and you're done. Now, if you go back to what we did, now you are not completely done, because what's happening here, like, if you look at any of those points, let's say, for example, like this point and this point, 
you are joining them with a nonlinear spring, right? And this nonlinear spring is only assigned to which degrees of freedom? Number six, the rotation, right? So this means like between those two points, there is nothing linking them in the X and Y direction for degrees of freedom. So what you need to do, you need to make those two points, which are, are basically on top of each other, you need them to move the same in X and Y. There is some rotation in between, depending on the spring, but in X and Y, you need to, them to move the same. So you need to put like constraint now. Okay, so similar to SAP. So what he tells you right now is that you define two nodes. Okay, so the program thinks that these nodes are flying, like they have no relation to each other. So you want to get them married. Yes. So you get them married with a spring, so you tell them that, you know, when the spring rotates, follow this rotation. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing you want them to do is that when one moves to the left, the other one moves to the left. When one moves to the right, the other one moves to the right. Up and down the same. So you need a constraint yes. to do it. So the same as SAP, like you have restraint, the one with the fixation and everything, and you have constraint like when you make everything like rigid body motion and all those things. So the command that we use is called equal DOF or equal degrees of freedom. So if you take this command, you need to specify the master node ID, which is the main one, and then the slave node ID. So one will follow the other, okay? And then you need to specify the, the tag of the degree of freedom you, are, you want to assign to this equal degree of freedom because we said like we have one, two, and six, right? So I need to assign one and two. So if you look like in your example here, so let's say I'm looking like at uh, point 0.21 and point 0.215. So 21, I'll make it the master and 21.5 is the slave. So I need to come here and then I say, so 21, 2.15, and the degrees of freedom is one and two, and that's it. Okay, now we know that at this point, at this uh, grid line, the second floor, the first axis, we know that we have uh, six actually points that we need to tie together. So we can do this here. So I come here again, point 21 was like uh, 214, if you remember the notation from your slides, again, one and two. And then you have uh, the other one and two and six. So this means that now I tied all the one at the rigid links over here. So two and six, two and five, two and four are now tied to 21. All right. And then you need to tie those two together at each uh, nonlinear spring. So point 0.215 and point 0.212, again, point 0.225 and 0.222, and so on and so on. Okay? Any questions? All right. So he imposes a constraint. Yeah. And if a node moves, the other ones will the same. Okay. Now, there is only one thing that we also need to do, like here, uh, if you remember, like from SAP, we said like we have like this rigid diaphragm or maybe flexible diaphragm and so on. So since I'm assuming that we have like pretty much over here, we have like a concrete slab. So this point 21 and this point 22 will move the same, uh, like in X, they will move the same because they are connected with this rigid diaphragm, the concrete slab or the floor system. So again, I need to tie point 0.22 and point 0.21 in the x direction, number one, and the same for point 0.32 and point 0.31 in the x direction. So that's why I come here and I put again equal degree of freedom, 31 and 32 in one, and I call it like the floor movement. Okay. So now we're done. We, done, we did the geometry and we did the assignment of everything, the material and the uh, elements. So here, like, uh, 
we said like after we finish we will go to this black box and we run it so so we know where at, uh, like at which point did we run did we come here successfully or something happened before so i put here like this command it says put and i say model built so this is just to print on the on this black screen at this point it will just write model built if something is wrong if something is wrong you won't sh see it so you will know that there is a problem from before so you will get a message yeah so you have to take care of it yes <laughs> no, I will not run this one. I will run to I have it here. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So now what we need to do, okay, we still have uh, assigning the masses and the, of course, the load cases. So uh, one comment. Yeah. yeah. So one other reason why it's uh, we would like to use this is that when your model starts to become heavy, Okay, because when you run nonlinear analysis, it could take substantial amount of time to compute the analysis, but not in your case. It could actually be relatively fast. One reason why the information can be, sorry, the simulation time could be relatively fast is because you can ask the program to give you exactly what you want. For if you want to see just displacements, you can ask the program to see four displacements. If, if you want to see column forces, you can, and that's it, you can ask the program to see column forces. So, if you are, uh, uh, if you are building, a, like, you know, even the model that you saw that he built in stuff, right? And it was, you know, a fairly small model and so on, but if you look at the output, I mean, it's like a huge file, because that program essentially asks by default that, you know, I would like to see everything. Uh, so here you can only see what exactly you need. Okay. And this is what he's going to talk about. Yeah. So, so what are we doing? remember also like those subroutines that we uh, sourced at the beginning for so, for displaying. All right. I'm running. Okay. So if you are confused, don't worry, <laughs> because we are you know we we are really good with this. Okay. The important thing is to understand the logic. And if you do like a very trivial example, like, you know, one big frame that you can even check static by hand, you will see that, you know, it's not a big thing to do it. Okay. Right now, your learning curve is like, you know, you did one step, but then, you know, when you do your example, it's going to go, you're going to go on the sky immediately. <laughs> so the important thing is to understand the logic. Okay. The commands, probably you don't, I mean, you, some of them don't even make sense. But this is a matter of like, you know, playing with it and, you know, getting used to it. Okay, uh, probably none of you knew Excel before, but now when you say whatever, absolute value in Excel, I and mean, this is kind of a language that you're using in Excel, I mean, this is the most trivial programming thing you can do. So here, technically, Tickle is a programming language that was tuned to be used with this program. So some of the ones, like, you know, equal with your freedom, okay, it makes sense, okay. Uh, if, you know, you are familiar with MATLAB, again, same story. If you want to do something in MATLAB, maybe, you know, the beginning was not very trivial, now it's actually very trivial, so it's the same thing. Okay, so don't worry, you know, you, you just need to really understand the logic. How are we doing? <laughs> Good? Good. Sorry. Good. How are we doing? Good. <laughs> okay. And, you know, for braces, we give you a gift. For whoever is dealing with braces, we will give you a gift. So basically, you know, we give you the element, you just specify the nodes, everything done internally. But don't worry. Okay. So. okay. So at this point, since we did the geometry, so I just call back this, uh, you know, subroutine that I did in the beginning, uh, display model 2D. Remember? In the beginning. So this is like in order to see that the structure, okay, for the first time. So... I need to specify, like, again, some parameters. Don't care about those parameters. You can just copy-paste. But basically what they say, I'm saying I want to see the structure and I want to see the node numbers written, the labels. Uh, use a scale factor of 5. But, of course, it doesn't matter here because there is no deformation. Uh, this is like there is a window that will appear, right? 
So 10 and 10, this is the location of the window where it's going to appear. Uh, 512384, this is like the size of the window. So anyway, like, doesn't matter here. So you can just use those ones and that's it. So recorders, we said like we need to record deformation forces for some specific elements or maybe for everything, it doesn't matter. So in order to do this, so the command that you have, it's called recorder. So it says recorder, and then you need to specify what are you going to record. Are you going to record things for a node or for an element? And then you need to specify the file a path. So what's the name of the file that you are going to save with the data inside it? And then you need to specify the node ID or the element ID and the degree of freedom that you want to save. For example, so here I'm saying recorder, the command, node. The file path is like results push over. This is the one we are creating in the beginning. Slash, I call it this floor three. This is what I call it. Dot out output it will be a text uh, file then i'm saying start saving the following the first column save the time so again it will be similar to abacus if you attended abacus like it will be with respect to time okay it doesn't matter if i don't want the time i just can take it out delete this one and then it will just save right away the the values of the output so the first column, I'm saying the time. The second column, I'm saying node 31, put degree of freedom number one. Displacement, this is how it's written. So this means for the top floor, like this point, I need to find this movement in the X direction. Okay, that's it. If you want to put again like uh, deformation in two, you can put like this. For the element, I'm saying here recorder element, again, the file path. So in the results push over folder slash column two one. So this is the column in the second floor, uh, second story, first access. Save in the first column in the text file, save the time. This arbitrary time doesn't have any meaning. It's not like dynamic analysis. Then, for element number 213311, this is the, the ID of the column, save the force. So in this one, it will save how many forces do we have for a given member? Three. X, Y, and rotation. Or like a shear, axial force, and moment. But we have it at both ends, right? So it will give me pretty much six columns of data that's it here in this one i'm saying for uh, for this I'm, i will run eigenvalue analysis and for it i need to save because there will be a shape of deformation for the for the structure so i need to save how much displacement at each floor that are constituting this eigenvalue one just don't care for this one for now, okay? Anyway, for masses now, we need to add masses and assign loads. So for masses, again, the command is very easy. I need to say mass, this is the command, then the node ID, and then how much mass I'm assigning in the X direction, in the Y direction, and in the Z direction which is like the rotation pretty much, like what we did in set. So here I'm saying for point 31, assign point 06, this is kilonewton per sec, uh, multiplied by second square over millimeter, right? For the X direction. Yeah, this is the units we're using, okay? Uh, and then for Y and Z, nothing, don't assign anything because pretty much we are looking into this 2D view. I don't care about any mode shapes in the vertical direction or for anything for rotation. 
what matters is all this direction in the x-axis. That's why like I don't want to activate all those uh, modes. Like remember in SAP, everything was activated when we put, when we assign masses to all degrees of freedom and we had like those weird uh, shapes, mode, mode shapes. So here I'm just assigning a very, very small number. How much? So this is it, like 1. 1, 10 to the power negative 9. Very, very small number. I don't put 0 because we said like if you put 0 and then inside if the program is dividing by 0, then we will have problem with infinity and so on. Okay. So that's it. Like I assign the mass. Again, I have like uh, four points. The four main points in my structure. Okay, now for the eigenvalue analysis. Okay, let me show you this one. Again, there is a command to run eigenvalue analysis. So this command is like this. It's eigen, okay? Like the command is pretty much like this. It just, you say eigen, and then you say the number of mode shapes that you want. Three, five, two. So th since this is a structure like two story, so I'm only interested like in just two eigenvalue. This is how I do it. And you're done. You don't need all of this. But since we said like here in the beginning, like I need to, uh, the values of the periods and everything, I need the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. I don't know if you remember how to solve an eigenvalue problem. So you need those eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues are pretty much the period or the frequency of your structure. So in order to do this, I write this command, which is basically this one, eigen2. I'm saying here eigen is equal, the number of eigenvalues is equal to 2. But then the output from this analysis, which is the eigen vectors and the eigenvalues, save them in this variable that I call it uh, lambda n. All right? And then I go here and I say lambda i or lambda j, or uh, maybe you can call it lambda 1 or lambda 2. So this is the eigen the eigenvalue for the first period or for the second period. So it will go into this variable and get it for the first uh, value will be for mode 1, the second value will be for mode 2, and so on. You don't need to, like, uh, okay, it's like this. It's already explained here. But for this part, you can just copy and paste it in your uh, file and it will run. And then after you do this, you just transform it like this lambda, which is the frequency, omega. You transfer it, transfer it into period. And to transfer from period to frequency, if you remember, you need to multiply by 2 pi or divide by 2 pi. And then I'm saying, okay, put on the screen how much is T1, how much is T2 in the black screen once I run. Okay? This is it. And here again, I call again this display mode 2D, and this time I'm telling him, like, don't show the node numbers. I want you to show me the mode shapes. Again, those are like the factors for uh, the screen and everything. Okay? Any questions for this one? If you want to do like uh, three mode shapes, so you just put this one equal to three. And maybe you add another line here for omega, and then you call it omega three. And then this one, maybe you can call it lambda k. And again here, so you need to put one more line. All right? Okay. Okay, static gravity analysis. We're almost done. <laughs> okay, so if you remember in SAP, we needed to define load pattern, and inside, uh, or uh, yeah, load pattern, and inside the load pattern, we assign the loads, right? If you remember in SAP. So the same here. I need to define a pattern, and this is the way to define. You will say pattern, okay? 
and then it's plain. There are different uh, types of uh, load pattern that you can assign. If you remember from SAP, we had like things like uh, the type is like live or like quick or something or model. So here you just use plain. So this is like something like static. And then you give it an ID, a number, integer number, anything. And then you specify like this is a linear case. If it's something like uh, it's not linear, it's something function in time, it will be transient. But here it's like linear. And then you open like those brackets like this. And inside the load pattern, you need to specify the load value, similar to SAP exactly. So here I'm saying load, apply load. Again, for the same four points where we applied the mass, the four points, how much load in X, in Y, and in Z. So I only have, if you remember from your slides, we have only gravity load in the Y direction, negative 200 kilonewton. So that's why I come here and I put negative 200 kilonewton. Okay. That's it. Now this part here, this part that you will take for now and you use it as it is. So this is like in SAP, this is what happens again in the background. When you say, okay, you can play with those parameters, but you pretty much say, okay, and you're done. So this is the good thing here about uh, open seas. This is specify how everything will be treated when you are trying to solve the numerical uh, equations that you have right now in your structure. So like the algorithms that you are going to use, the integrator, like uh, the type of analysis, yeah, Newton and all those things, if you remember. For now, you don't care, you can just copy this and just paste it and that's it. But if you are doing like some rigorous linear analysis, maybe if you run it like this, the solvers, and it didn't converge, maybe I can come here and play with those numbers to relax the tolerance a little bit or something like this or increase the number of iterations so I can make it uh, solve. So here I'm saying apply those forces, the 200 kilonewton, in load control with a load factor of 0.1, meaning it will apply 0.1 of the 200 in one step then it will apply another point one in the second step and so on for a total of 10 steps. So it will apply this 200 in 10 steps. I can do it differently. I can maybe say 0 0.05 in 20 steps. Doesn't matter, it's up to you, okay? But this is just for applying gravity. And then after I finish, I will say, okay, now after you do this, put just right on the right on the screen that gravity is done, and maybe show me now the deformed shape after you have the gravity load. Pushover analysis. The same thing, nothing changed. The same as this one. I need to define load pattern. So here I defined again new load pattern and I gave it a new ID. This time I call it 222, you can call it anything, it doesn't matter. Again, it's linear. And this one I'm saying like how I'm going to push my structure. So actually I'm pushing my structure, if you remember in SAP, we pushed the structure using uh, forces, right? If you remember, we applied like those lateral forces. Here I'm not applying forces, I'm applying displacement. Why? Because at the end, so this is what we call, if, I don't know if you heard, heard this before, like displacement control and force control. Yes, so what this means, here if I, if I said like, let's say for this kind of structure that I'm exper uh, expecting some deterioration to happen. If I said, apply like say 1000 kilonewton, like very large number in steps, okay? So what will happen? Okay, the structure will apply first like say 100 kilonewton and then the displacement or the drift of the roof will be this much, agree? No problem, you have, you have uh, equilibrium. 
then you will apply 200 kilonewton the other point you got it 300 you got it 400 500 600 700 you can still get equilibrium but when you come here to 700 there is nothing because now the curve is going down that's why like with force control you will not be able to do this kind of thing because now the program will come to 700 you will say i can't converge so now what so he will try to roll back and then he will keep rolling back till this point but afterward he can't go because if he need to go like this way he will need to decrease the force and if he uh, if the program decreases the force then it will find equilibrium at this point not at this point you see the issue so that's why i'm pushing the structure in displacement control so i'm telling this the other way around so i'm saying okay push like one inch how much was the force this much push two how much this much three four five so it doesn't matter so i keep moving with this displacement control yes but usually you have a force <laughs> yeah so yeah 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 so definitely you would have the force but in this way i'm not applying a force i'm applying displacement so it's i have the structure i'm pushing the top by two inches or two centimeter i did the force right i apply the force but i'm not telling the program that i apply the force i'm saying i'm applied just the displacement and the program will roll back and give me how much was the force how much was the reaction because typically you would apply a force and then the program will tell you how much was the displacement i'm saying the different i'll tell the program i will apply the displacement now you tell me how much was the force why because if i went with the force at one point if i'm deteriorating like this i will not get this part of the curve understand yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay it will make sense like uh, once we see it so it, that's why like here okay so here again so i'm saying so this for the load pattern now it's displacement control so i'm saying here integrator it's called displacement control if you remember from the top it was load control right so now i'm saying to the program okay now the way you are going to do it it's in displacement control and i'm telling it push this node which is the control node which is actually i defined here at 3 1 the roof push this node in which degree of freedom i'm saying here in the degree of freedom number one which is the x direction okay so push this node in direction number one using this increment here in the top i you i said apply this load with this increment right so here i'm saying apply this displacement at this point with this increment how much is this increment i defined it here as 0.05 millimeter okay now what will happen it will go to point 31 and it will push it with 0.05 millimeter in, in the start right how much point uh, the the floor uh, beneath which is like uh, 0.21 how much will it move so i'm saying here in the load pattern i'm saying if 0.31 moved by 2.6 0.21 will move by 1.18 what are those values okay ignore those values let's say if i said if 0.31 moved by one millimeter 0.21 will need to move by 0.5 so if you apply at the beginning 0.05 this one will be 0.025 right and so on so this is like the profile of the push so what were those two values that I, the very weird values that i have in the beginning so those two values i got it from the, I ran this program in the beginning and then I got the first mode profile how the structure deforms in first mode and then I got those two values how much are they are with respect to each other 
and those are the values that he used here. If you remember, in the recorders, this one that we skipped, I said for mode number one, record the displacement of the three points. So when this thing ran, the structure behaved like this. So I got the deformation here and the deformation here. So this one was like, uh, what was the one in before, like 2.6, and this one was like 1.18. So I used this same proportional between the two displacement to apply, to apply the push over. You can do something different, it's fine. But typically when we do this kind of push over analysis, we use the first mode period. Questions? Many? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so that's it. So again, similar. Again, this part here, those are all the solvers that you, you don't need to care about for now. Here I said, like, uh, do a step of 0 0.05 with total steps of 20. Or maybe we had it like 0 0.1 and total steps of 10. Here I'm saying... Analyze this much, it's not 10, but there is a number. How much is the number? Well, I'm pushing till how much is the maximum push, how much is the displacement, and how much is the increment. I'm moving with an increment of 0.05, and the final push, I will push to 10% of the height of the building. So if the height of the building is 100 feet, I will push 10 feet. Okay? So this is what I'm saying. So if you sub divide D max by D increment, then you will get the number of steps that you need to run. Okay? Okay, let's see what's happening here. So now if I do this, Well, it will be underwhelming, like don't uh, put your hopes up. But uh, so this is how it will look like. So you will say source, and then you will say open C's tutorial.tcl. Now, I think after I run it, I think it will appear on my main screen here, but let's see. Uh, ah, there, there was like, uh, there was well, this... Uh, <clears throat> One second. Uh, okay, so I run it again. So, okay, so it appears here. So now the first thing that appeared, this one, and then this one. <laughs> yeah. Top graphics, huh? <laughs> okay. It's like Pixar. Okay, so now you see, like, this is the first window that we ask for, like, with the node numbers. This is the first mode shape, and here it says, like, the period. And this is the second mode shape, and now it's actually running the pushover. If you see the structure, it's moving. And if you pay, like, if you look very closely, so now there is no extrude, nothing like this. So now you see the points here? For the offset, for the plastic hinge. Actually, now you see what's happening in the beam, like this uh, rotation happening, like this beam. At those points, you have now some nonlinear behavior. So at those points, at the nonlinear springs, now you start having like some rotation. You don't look impressed. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so this is what's happening. So now it's keep pushing until it reaches like 10% uh, of uh, the height of the building, like in drift. And that's it. Yeah, so what's happening here? Like if I look at, uh, okay, let's, I think it will stop right now. It's uh, very fast. If you look in the results, like push over. So you see those commands here, like all those uh, files that we ordered like for the results. 
So now, because it's still running, so now everything like a zero kilobyte, but once it finish, you will have the values inside. So you see, this is the first mode. Oh, wait. Yeah, but now you know it, you can download the OpenSys Navigator. But because in OpenSys Navigator, you still need to use like some of the same uh, notation, like uh, degree of freedom one and degree of freedom two, and this UniAxial material. So now if you download the OpenSys Navigator, you will get a better user interface for sure. Hey. Yeah, we're coming. Uh, yeah? yeah? Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay, almost done. So you see what's happening here at the plastic hinge, at the spring, because the nonlinear behavior is happening here. And this thing, it's like, because it's rigid, so nothing happens. So all the yielding, so that's it. If you look here, you see... So here it says like uh, model built, all the things that we said, T1 is equal to 0.8 seconds, T2 is equal to whatever, eigen analysis done, gravity done, push over complete, all the things we said like write down, doesn't matter. So okay, here like if I look at displacement, if I open one of those, so that's it, you have two columns, right? The first column is like time, and the second column is the displacement of the roof. So you can take this one, control A, control C. You can open Excel, paste like this, finish. And then uh, you go again to column one, one. So this is the, like the first floor. If you remember, I said like it will save six columns because at both ends you have three forces. So if I take this one, control A, control C, and then come here and paste again. All right, so if I take this displacement and I divide by the height of the building, I will get the drift, right? Or let's for now just take it like displacement as it is. And then I need to plot the shear force uh, the the pushover curve, this one, base shear versus the roof drift. Okay, so let's plot it. So how it will look like. So insert like this. Okay, now all X. Okay, so let's put it here. Okay, so now the X axis will be the displacement of the roof. Or you can divide it by uh, the height of the building and you have the roof drift ratio. You see? And now the second column, so this is the shear, this is the axial force, and this is the moment. So this is the force in the x direction, this is the force in the y direction, and this is the moment or... So that's why like, if you look at uh, here, in the first 10 steps, remember, we said we are applying the gravity load in 10 steps. So here, it was 200 kilonewton, correct? But here I see 400, why? Because this is the first story column, it has 200 and 200 from the top floor. So you have like 40, 80, so on, so on, until you reach 400. And afterwards, this value is starting to decrease, why? Because now you're starting to push sideways. This means that you are trying to apply overturning, right? So you are applying like tension on the column. So that's why like... So that's it. If you take this one, actually let me take the shear force at the end because it will be positive. So that's it. That's your pushover. <laughs> that's it, yeah. <laughs> So that's it. Now you can see at what point you see here, it was going elastic. And at this point, the stiffness of the structure changed. This means what? This means that at this point, yielding happened at one of the springs. And then you have another kink over here. This means that you had 
another yielding in another spring. And then at one point you had, you reached the capping point in many springs and now you're starting to deteriorate. Cool? All right. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, try to uh, do this like at home as fast as possible. And after, of course, we, uh, uh, we will, I'll send you this file and so on. But when you start doing, uh, playing with open seas, don't start with like a frame. Start with like a cantilever, like try a model a cantilever with a spring, non-linear spring. And play with the different materials and so on. Something that you are sure what you are getting. So you apply like force or something. And then you know that if you apply force on a cantilever, you know that the deflection is like uh, PL cube over 3i. So you can calculate by hand. Or you do it in SAP and you do it here and see if you get any different results. That's it. Any questions? Yeah? It is possible to import the graphics in a um, LaTeX program? The graphics from OpenSeas? Yes. Uh, probably. In which program? LaTeX. Ah, LaTeX? It's used to, to write like Word. Mm, probably. I never tried it. Too. Or you can uh, download the, <laughs> or you can download the Open Seas Navigator, and then you will have all of those things. All right. Okay. Thank you for attending, and uh, see you in the next seminar. <laughs>